Francis Crick and Christoph Koch made a very bold proposal back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that the primary visual cortex, the target of today's talk, is not conscious. I found no better way to start this lecture than to quote Francis Crick, who is a Nobel laureate. He was the co-discoverer of the double helix structure of DNA. And in his later days, he turned to become a vision scientist. He said, the two rather surprising aspects of our present knowledge of the visual system. The first is how much we already know. By any standards, the amount is enormous. The other surprising thing is that, in spite of all of this work, we really have no clear idea how we see anything. And that might sound absurd, but I want to give you some demonstrations that I think show exactly what he's talking about. So this right here, if you read really fast, might read to you a bird in the bush. But if I ask you to read again, you might figure out that it says a bird in the, the bush. So there's an interesting disconnection here between your idea of how vision works, which is that there are certain visual images hitting your eye, and then your brain is translating that into a perception of the world. In fact, it seems that your perception of the world, sometimes at least such in these cases, can be dissociated or clearly is deviating from the image in your eye. And another example of this might be this. If you look at this image, you might immediately recognize it as Coca-Cola, but if I point out, read again, you might see that it's not the actual Coca-Cola sign. So what Francis Crick and his coworker Christoph Koch in the 1990s proposed is that when it comes to vision, the image that falls into the back of our eyes is processed by the central nervous system, by the brain. And there must be two types of neural processes happening at all times, shown here in blue and in yellow. And the blue types of neural activities shown here with these action potentials as a function of time, those are neural processes that occur without you being aware of it. So when I showed you Coca-Cola, something in your brain is reading Coca-Cola because it's processing the image as it falls onto your eye. But it's not what makes it into your mind. So there must be a second set of neural mechanisms that somehow translates into your perception of Coca-Cola, despite there being Coca-Cola on the screen. And they termed the second set of neural mechanisms the neural correlates of consciousness. And the idea was that we can never causally define in science what causes what. All that we can do as experimentalists is we can observe that whenever one thing occurs, another thing occurs as well, usually a little bit delayed in time. So we're only looking at correlations. And the best we could do as neuroscientists is find neural processes, neural mechanisms, and then whenever they occur, your consciousness occurs. So that's why they're called the neural correlates of consciousness. Now, before I move on, I want to point out that there's been frequent misunderstandings of what we mean when we talk about consciousness. In this case, it really just means your visual perception your subjective experience, the fact that you see things and you're not just a robot or a computer that is just registering information. It also means that certain other processes that are very closely related and familiar to you, they're not what we mean about consciousness. So for example, it seems that usually we attend to what we consciously perceive or vice versa. You do not have to read all of this, by the way. I'm just showing you that this is a study that it's a, a meta study that I published with a colleague. And what we did is we looked into the literature and we specifically looked at studies. Here you can see with the icon, those are studies done with fMRI machines. There are studies done here with EEG. And all of these studies used very clever manipulations where people attended or didn't attend. And they did so for stimuli that were either conscious or unconscious. So for various ways, stimuli were manipulated so that people did not consciously perceive them, or they did. And they showed that there's an interaction there. These two things are actually dissociable. So here's some more EEG data. I'm not going to talk about all of the details, 
the main message that I want to convey to you is that there's a lot of data at this point that suggests and shows that attention is something fundamentally different from consciousness, the way that I've defined it. So whether you subjectively perceive something or not seems to be discoverable from attention. So attention is an extra mechanism that happens. And we know that because of behavior, but more than that, because the brain reacts differently in these two cases. Another study that I'm pointing out here did something very similar, and it looked at the relationship between subjective experience of perception, consciousness, and working memory. So if you think about working memory, it's everything that you are experiencing right now that you could immediately recall. And there too, I'm just going to highlight the sentence from this long uh, wall of text. The meta-analysis supports the existence of unconscious working memory. So there too, it seems to be that you can have working memory about items that never entered your consciousness. Hence, these two things, working memory and consciousness, have to be two separate processes. OK, so if you're interested then in what is causing your subjective experience, and of course you should be, because that is what makes your life interesting. If your whole life would be spent as if you were under general anesthesia and you're never experiencing anything, no love, no pain, no joy, your life would probably a lot less interesting than what your life is right now. And so what I'm getting at is what are the brain mechanisms that allow you to experience love, to experience joy, to experience all of these things? Well, when it comes to vision, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch made a very bold proposal back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where they said, we have to be scientific about it. And their proposal was that the primary visual cortex, the target of today's talk, is not conscious. And they published this in the Journal of Nature, which to a lot of people is the most prestigious journal in the known mapped universe. And the title was, Are We Aware? of neural activity in primary visual cortex. And as I just said, the answer, the proposed answer was no. So they would argue that when light enters your eye and makes it onto the retina, that launches a cascade, a wave of neural activity that via the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, makes it onto the primary visual cortex, or V1. And that is the primary gateway to the rest of all of these cortical areas that you have that process vision. And they argued that since there's no feedback from higher areas that uh, are involved in uh, decision making and action planning, primary visual cortex cannot be part of this loop between perceiving and acting. And that was one of their primary arguments why they said that this distinction between the nor neural correlates of consciousness, again here in yellow, and the neural activity that you're not conscious of happens after the primary visual cortex. If you doubt this, I can tell you that it's very easy to convince yourself that the activity in your retina is not part of the neural correlates of consciousness. So you might be wondering if somebody by a very unfortunate turn of events would lose their eye, would lose their retina, they would be blind, right? So you need your eye in order to see. Well, the inverse is not true. If you close your eyes and I say Taylor Swift, you can see something in front of you. So you do not need your eyes, you do not need your retina to see. In fact, just a couple of hours ago, when you were lying in bed in deep sleep and dreaming, you conjured up all kinds of visual imagery without any light hitting your eyes. So you do not need your retina for consciousness. It seems to be somewhere else. And the crucial question is, is it the primary visual cortex? Well, in their argument, they said that there are people that have lost the primary visual cortex. So the people without a primary visual cortex, they're blind but they can still dream at night. So it seems that, again, the parts of the neural machinery that give rise to your consciousness happen later on. Now, if that's the case, and if there's something that's different about we one of these other areas, we want to know what it is. So what I will tell you about today is the role of the primary visual cortex in this whole machinery of neural activity that is giving rise to visual perception, and we will talk about the anatomy of the primary visual cortex, things that you can see just by looking at it. We'll talk about the function of the primary visual cortex, and then I will come back to what I just talked about in the beginning. So let's start with the anatomy of the primary visual cortex. 
So primary visual cortex, or V1, are basically synonymous terms. Sometimes you also hear stride cortex or area 17. That's all the same thing. It's this area shown here in green. So that is a human brain that you look at from the side. That's the left hemisphere of a human brain. And this would be the right hemisphere if we remove the left hemisphere. So you're looking basically as you would be looking onto my face right now. And we will remove the skull. That's the first thing you would see. And if we remove half of the brain, then this is what you see. And that's to show you geometrically where in green right here the primary visual cortex is located. And the first thing that should strike you is that it's the furthest away it could be from the eyes. So your eyes, of course, are in the front of your head. In fact, that is why there is some space right here in your brain, because the eyes are really large. You're only seeing part of it. The round, of course, that would fall out of your skull if you would see the whole part. So they're pretty big. They're right there. And the neural activity has to make it all the way to the furthest part that's away from the eyes, at the very back of the brain. And it's folded in because our whole brain is folded. And it was first described by Brodmann, who came up as one of the first scientists with a map of the entire brain in terms of just looking at it under the microscope and finding that there are differences if you just look at the pattern of neurons, and you can see that the primary visual cortex is distinct. Now, this kind of technique of staining the brain for different types of neurons and then looking at its anatomy we call cytoarchitecture. Cyto meaning cell and architecture, of course, for how it is built up. And area 17, again, primary visual cortex, is the exact same area. And if you look at how it's wired up, the first thing that you find is that of course, each of the eyes has only one output, the optic nerve. It carries the information, the axons of about one million ganglion cells. And each eye then meets right there where the optic nerves, they cross. And then half of each eye's optic nerve makes it to the middle of your brain, literally the midbrain, the lateral geniculate nucleus being part of the thalamus. And from there, we have neurons that send their axons via what we call the optic radiation all the way to the back of your brain, or V1. And you can, just from the knowledge that you have so far, probably make out what the amount of information is that arrives in the primary visual cortex. So I already told you that there's about a, a million ganglion cells. So you have a million pixels, a gigapixel, in each of your eyes. And each neuron can fire about a 1,000 times a second. So you have about a gigabit per second as maximal information that can leave each of your eyes much less than your phone can do and, and your laptop can do. Now, if we look at the rest of the brain, and so this right here is a brain from a macaque monkey, and this is a common technique that anatomists use where they flatten the brain, so they get rid of all of these folds that are sometimes confusing. So this is looking at a brain as if it were a piece of paper before it gets crumbled up. What you can see is, yes, there are all of these different brain areas. We confirmed the work by Corbinian Brodman, and in color, you can see all of the brain areas whose primary task, whose primary function seems to be vision. And the first thing that strikes you is that, oh my gosh, that's pretty much half of the brain. Well, that's the reason why your dominant sense is vision rather than smelling, for example. So you orient your life much more around what you see than what you feel or hear. And the primary visual cortex, shown right here, again connected to the retina and the lateral geniculate nucleus, is the largest of all of these visual areas. That's the first thing to know. And second, it's the only one that feeds into this whole system. That is the reason why if primary visual cortex gets destroyed, you're blind as if you would lose your eye. Now, if you look more closely, and so this is showing you if you stain for cytoarchitecture and then you zoom increasingly in with a microscope, the thing that really pops out about the primary visual cortex, or uh, the striate cortex, is that it has striation. You find that it has these very prominent layers that these neighboring areas don't seem to have. In fact, if you look at the transition between the primary visual cortex and the immediately neighboring area, which conveniently after V1 we call V2, you can see that by eye, you can see where one ends and the other one starts. That's one of the very few places in the brain where that is possible. And that was discovered actually more than 100 years ago by an Italian scientist called Gennari. And he saw back then, just by candlelight, holding up a slice of brain, that there's an extra line that seems to be prominent in V1 that you don't see in these other areas. And we call it the line of Gennari after him.
And these lines are interesting. So there seems to be striation or lamina structure to the brain, and that will become interesting in a moment. Now, the other interesting aspect of the primary visual cortex is that people mapped cartographically what the correspondence is between the image in the eye and the image of the primary visual cortex. So, so this is a complicated diagram, so let me walk you through it. So first I want to draw your attention to this right here. This shows your visual field. So if you point your eye right to the center of this coordinate system, then this would be your fovea, the point of your sharpest vision of seeing. But of course, your vision extends above and below and to the left and to the right. So you have a field in front of you that can be centered onto your gaze. And that means we can provide coordinates. We can say how far apart something is from the center. Typically, we measure that in degrees in terms of how many degrees do you have to move your eyes to go from this point to that point. And that means that we can basically create a map of the whole visual world as it is right in front of you and give every little point in that world a street address. And that then allows us to, right here, go all the way to the back of your brain and then see where do each of these parts of the street address fall onto the primary visual cortex. And what you find is there's a preservation. So the primary visual cortex responds to the visual image, to the visual world, exactly as it falls into the back of your eye. Two things that are close together in front of you, they end up activating neurons that sit close together in the back of your brain. Now, there's no a priori reason that this should be the case. Your brain keeps track of where all of the information is coming from. So it could completely scramble the outputs of all of these neurons and still do fine. It knows, after all, which neuron is from where. So there's a little bit of a mystery here why the brain keeps things so orderly. So what I'm telling you is that if you would very carefully look at all of these neurons in the back of your brain, you would be able to recreate the visual image that's in front of you. With what I just told you, that as you're dreaming at night, you're conjuring up visual images, that means we could put you in an MRI machine and watch that movie that is your dream by reading out the activity in primary visual cortex. In fact, there's active work going on trying to do just that. But this map, in the back of your brain, in the primary visual cortex, and that's the second important point, is not accurate. It's distorted. It's heavily distorted, and we call this effect cortical magnification, and we believe it is because of the way that the neural system works and your brain works, in that when information moves from one part of the neural system to another, very often we find that there's a disparate amount of neurons. And there's two processes that can happen right there. One is called convergence, and the other one is called divergence. There's only two possibilities. In fact, there's kind of three. You could have the same neurons in the retina and the LGN, for example. Or you could have less neurons in the LGN. In that case, by logic, you would have several neurons in the eye, in the retina, converging or innovating one and the same LGN neuron. And you can have divergence, and that is what's happening in the primary visual cortex. So I told you that you have about a million receptor neurons in your eye, so that makes two million, but you have an order of magnitude more, 200 million neurons in the primary visual cortex. So that is interesting, that your brain is taking very limited information of about a million neurons, and it's blowing it up to 100 neurons for each of these neurons that you have. And the effect of that is, as I said, that the whole image gets distorted. So if we take any visual image right in front of you, the first part of distortion is just the lens and very simple optics that if you have a single lens, the optical image gets flipped upside down and left to right. And that is why if you look at this person's face, you would have an upside down, left to right flipped version of that image in the back of your brain. But the second part, watch this you're not having an accurate map of the whole face. If you're looking at this person's mouth, most half or more of your primary visual cortex responds to the mouth, and then very little of your primary visual cortex responds to what's left and right or above and below your center of view. So about half of your primary visual cortex is exclusively interested in the foveal region of your vision, right where your gaze lands. And that's above a region that if you stretch out your arm exactly and you take up your thumb, 
and you look at your thumbnail, that's about your fovea. It's about two degrees across. That's the region that your brain spends half of its primary visual cortex on. All right, back to these layers that the primary visual cortex has. That is the second most striking anatomy. And there's different people that come up with different schemes how to call these different layers. But what has settled more or less in the last couple of years is that there are six main layers. You can see them here in Roman numerals, one, two, three, and then all of these is layer four, and then la layers five and six. And there's been some confusion about layer 4C, and I apologize that I'm getting a little bit in the weeds here, but it is important, as you will see in a moment. Layer 4C turns out to be the same layer that the rest of your brain has as layer 4. So what we believe has happened is that Corbinian Broadman made a mistake when he came up with his atlas of the brain, and that mistake he only made for primary visual cortex of E1. And it's still with us, and it's causing a lot of confusion, which is that layer 4A and layer 4B are actually really part of layer 3. So when I will talk about layer 4, what I mean is layer 4C. Why is layer 4C important? Well, if we use dyes that can travel throughout the brain, so for example, we insert dyes in the lateral geniculate nucleus, and we see where it goes in the primary visual cortex, or we do the inverse, we insert dyes in higher visual areas, and we see how, where does it go in the primary visual cortex, we find that there's two distinct patterns, and if you squint your eyes, you might be able to see it, where anything that comes from the eye, that's V4 by 2V1, ends pretty much in the middle. It's the meat of the hamburger, if you will. So you can see this right here in layer 4C, whereas all of the activity that comes from the rest of the brain ends in the layers above and below, with some exceptions, because we're talking about biology. So when it comes to these layers, there seems to be very interesting architecture where what comes from the bottom up ends in the middle, and whatever the rest of your brain is interested in terminates above and below. Now, the last anatomical piece of structure I should mention is what we call cytochrome oxidase blobs. And you can see those right here, it's those darker, little patches, and you can see them in this brownish stain over here. Cytochrome oxidase blobs, they only occur in the upper layers of V1. They're very specific to certain primates in V1, and we have no idea what they do. And that's all I can tell you about cytochrome oxidase blobs. So what do we know about what V1 does? So let's talk about function. So most of the function of primary visual cortex has been established by inserting painlessly Microelectrodes, so very, very tiny electrodes into neural tissue. Neural tissue doesn't have pain receptors, so you can do this. And those are about the size of a tenth of a human hair. So this is a very famous picture that you will often see about what scientists do when they record neural activity, electric activity from nerve cells. That picture is totally inaccurate. So this electrode would actually be of very different size when it comes to these neurons. And there's been only two Nobel Prizes in all of systems neuroscience where people looked at function. Both of those, one rather recent, one of them back in the 1980s, used microelectrodes to study the activity of neurons. And so the one in the 1980s was given to David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. And you can see those two right here. And their work was on the primary visual cortex. So what I will tell you today was one of very few Nobel Prizes. So what did they do? Well. The story goes that they inserted these microelectrodes and they were counting the impulses, the, these electric impulses that neurons send as a function of time. And you can see this right here. And what they told for years after they got the Nobel Prize was that back then they didn't have computer monitors, they didn't even have TV screens. So what they did is they used a slide presenting mechanism and the slide at some point stuck. And so if a slide st sticks, you get the white background and then just get a black line right where the slide is. And that's when the neurons started firing. So they realized that these neurons, they seem to like lines. And that was the clue. They showed all of these different lines to these neurons, and they found out not only do these neurons in V1 pretty much exclusively respond to lines, but only to certain orientations. So some V1 neurons respond to vertical lines, some to horizontal lines, and so on. And that is very different from what you find in the eye and the lateral geniculate nucleus, where these neurons respond to a spot of light. So something happens 
in between the LGN and V1 where spots of light get transferred or mapped on two lines. So the receptive fields are not concentric anymore, they're linear. And the model that Hubel and Wiesel proposes, that is very easy to explain with one of these mechanisms that I introduced before, with convergence. So if you have these concentric receptive fields in the retina, well, depending on how they innervate a V1 neuron, let's say these three neurons right here, innervate this V1 neuron, well, that V1 neuron should get the most strong activation when you have a line activating all of these three neurons in tandem. Each of them responds only to a blob of light, but a line activates all three of them, hence you get a neuron that responds to a line. And if you take a different wiring diagram where these neurons would innervate a V1 neuron, well, now you get a diagonal line and so on, so you get the idea. So that was the most famous model given by Thorsten Wiesel and David Hubel, they got the Nobel Prize for it. And there's a little bit of a side note, which is that people have noted that you also, if you look very carefully, do not find perfectly concentric neurons in the I and the LGN. But you already find that there's a little bit of a bias or a slant to certain lines. So this model that I just showed you, take it with a pinch of salt. But be as it may, what is true for, sh for sure is that primary visual cortex, the main input of your brain that gets most of the information from the eye, it seems to analyze the visual image in terms of lines. It's interested in lines. And that, more than that, has this shape of being selective for certain orientations other than others. So this would be one neuron that really gets active here on the y-axis as a function of line orientation on the x-axis. This likes a vertical line, and it doesn't respond as much to other lines. And we call that, because these discoveries were made back in a time where radio was the big thing, and you had to tune your radio to a certain frequency, we call this neural tuning. And this kind of curve that you get when you test neurons for which orientations they prefer, a tuning function. And that has severe implications. So I can do an experiment with you to prove that this happens in your brain. And it's a very simple experiment. What I would like you to do is just rest your eyes right here in the center of the display. You can move your eyes left to right, left to right, left to right, if it gets boring, but don't move them away. So while you listen to me and you look at these lines, you can probably make out without directly looking at it that there's two patterns of lines and that they're slightly slanted, they're slightly tilted. So what we're doing while you keep your eyes rested on this is we're adapting or fatiguing these neurons, and they won't be able to respond fully anymore after this. And of course, that means that there's different sets of neurons above and below that line, one tilted to leftward tilt and one to rightward tilt. So in three seconds, I'm gonna show you a different pattern. Just keep your eyes right there. And all I will do is I will show you straight lines above and below, but watch what happens to your perception. Three, two, one. And if things went well, you should have very briefly observed a slant to the opposite directions than what you just saw. And that's because these neurons that have these tuning curves, if I showed you a leftward slant, they went out of juice, they were not able to fully respond anymore, and that means that the overall response in your primary visual cortex was shifted. And it shows you that the rest of your brain really has no idea what's in your eye. It blindly trusts the primary visual cortex. And if I mess with your primary visual cortex neurons, it distorts your entire perception. All right, what else do we know about primary visual cortex? Well, we know that this selectivity for certain line orientations, this orientation tuning, interacts with the lamina pattern. So if I move a microelectrode from layer one all the way to layer six, I can find that all these neurons that sit underneath each other more or less have the same orientation tuning. And if I move the electrode the other way, orthogonally, across the surface of the brain, we find that this line orientation is slowly, uh, slowly changing. So this gave rise to the idea of columns, that your whole brain is made up of neurons that sit right underneath each other and they do the same thing. If you don't think that that's an interesting question, let me tell you that somebody did and got a billion dollars for it. This is the basis of the European Brain Project. Again, a billion euros rather than dollars. And that whole idea was that if we can understand 
how a single column works, let's say in your primary visual cortex, the rest of the brain can be done as child's play because the rest of the brain basically just consists of multiple copies that sit side by side of these cortical columns. Now, if you look at the top of the brain, these so-called orientation columns, they give rise to a pattern. So color-coded, this is looking at your primary visual cortex from the top down. And color-coded, you can see how these neurons respond to vertical lines or mostly to horizontal lines and orientations in between. And you can see there are these columns and they give rise to a structure we call pinwheel structure. And it's because if you look closely within these columns, you can see these pinwheels where the colors seem to be swirling around a certain center. There's only one more major piece that I can tell you about the function, function of V1 and its interaction with structure. So this is another piece of vision that is very often underappreciated. If you ask little children, where are your eyes? What they do is they take a finger, they put it onto their face, and they end up right on their nose in between their eyes. And that's a really smart answer. Because the way that the world seems to you is, is as if you had only one eye. The per perspective that you perceive of the world is as if you had one eye, like a Greek cyclops, right in between your eyes. How this works, we have no idea. But you know that that's the case because if you, for example, take your arm and you take your index finger and you put it right on my face as I sit here and you close one eye and you close the other eye, you will see that that finger jumps with respect to my face. So that means in each eye you have a very different image and somehow your brain synthesizes that into one. And we believe that the, we believe that the primary visual cortex is central in this task. So as I said earlier on, the world in front of you, of course, ends up uh, as two discrete images in your left and right eye. And then those outputs from these two images, they get combined and end up in the back of your brain. And if you test neurons in the primary visual cortex for do you like one eye better than the other eye, most of them say yes. And that's another unique feature. So I tried to show you this in this cartoon where if both eyes, it would be the left eye and the right eye, are the exact same strength here of darkness, that would mean that the neuron, if I show something to the left or the right eye, would respond equally. And the neuron that I chose right here shows you that it actually prefers the left, right, the left eye slightly over the right eye. We call this ocular dominance. Ocular meaning eye and dominance, that one eye dominates over the other eye for each neuron. And so this neuron, prefers the left eye, and if we move the electrode down and we test the other neurons that sit underneath each other, again, we find this columnar structure. Neurons that sit underneath each other in V1, they all prefer the same eye. But if we move the electrode left to right across the surface of cortex, what we find is that that slowly changes. So there are neurons that like both eyes equally, and then you find neurons that more and more prefer one eye. And there are some neurons, we call those monocular neurons, that only respond to one of the two eyes. They're blind to what is happening in the other eye. And if you keep going, then this inverses. So this gives rise to a second set of columns in the primary visual cortex. They're actually larger than the orientation columns. And that has profound implications. For example, if somebody loses one eye because of an accident early in life, your brain will realize, so to say, that there are a lot of neurons that used to respond to this eye that now have no more job to do. And your brain, as any other organ in your body, is very good at not wasting any resources. So when it comes, in, when it comes to neuroscience, the golden rule is use it or lose it. Neurons that don't respond, they die apoptotically. So what that means is if you take the brain of an individual that unfortunately lost an eye early in life, what you find is that half of their V1 neurons are gone and you will find this zebra stripe kind of like pattern of V1 where only half of the primary visual cortex is left over, and those are all the neurons that respond to the other eye. I want to put in a little bit of a caveat here that, of course, this is all simplified in the little bit of time that I have, and it's cut cartoonified, and it's a little bit not exactly what the truth is, so if you look much more carefully in the lateral geniculate nucleus or in the primary visual cortex, what you will find is that, yes, these neurons often only respond to one eye, most of the time prefer one eye, but there is crosstalk 
between the two eyes, starting in the lateral geniculate nucleus and then quite pronounced in the primary visual cortex. So this is some work that my lab did a couple of years ago showing that basically there are almost maybe none if so, very few really monocular neurons in the primary visual cortex. So if you test very carefully, you find that most of these neurons get information about the other eye as well. All right, what else? So here I'm gonna go very briefly because I have to mention it. We know that when it comes to the direction of motion, the primary visual cortex also has neurons that have tuning for it, selectivity for it. So it's one of the other visual features that seem to get processed and the primary visual cortex, neurons therein, is quite interested in disparity. Now, what is disparity? Disparity is what I said before, that if you look at one eye's image and the other eye's image, there is a shift between them. That makes sense. You have one eye to the one side of your head and another eye to the other side of your head. So, of course, the images are shifted sideways. And that sideways shift can be used because of Pythagorean's theorem, where you can make out the distance of a triangle if you know the angle and you know the other line that completes a triangle. You can triangulate the distance of objects by knowing the difference between the two eyes. That is what we call disparity. It's a disparity in position between the two eyes. And there are neurons in the primary visual cortex that have tuning to disparity. So these neurons probably allow the rest of your brain to compute 3D positions. Now, that's of course the reason that if you watch a 3D movie, you will have to put on special goggles because we'll have to separate what your left eye sees and what your right eye sees for you to get this 3D effect. Again, that's thanks to the primary visual cortex. And lastly, this is gonna be fun. This is not gonna sound like fun, but it's gonna be fun. The primary visual cortex responds to something that we call spatial frequency. Spatial frequency is the 2D equivalent of frequency as you know it. So here you see different sine waves or cosines, and you can see that this right here has a different frequency than this one. So there's more cycles in a certain time or region right here than right there. So we call this lower frequency and this higher frequency. And of course, the second parameter that we have when we look at frequency is just how large this frequency is fluctuating. So the magnitude or amplitude is the second parameter. Both these numbers, if you will, translate into images. So if you would think of this frequency here not happening as a function of time, but as a function of space, where the upper peaks would be perfectly white and the troughs would be perfectly black and you're slowly gradiating between those, you would get an image like that. In other words, if I would cross section this right here in the middle and I would ask someone to come up with a one dimensional plot that describes this grading, it would look exactly like this. So this means that this grading we can describe in a certain frequency. It's how many black and white stripes you have as a function of space. And you can see that a low spatial frequency translates into a grading with lesser stripes. So in other words, any image that you see has different frequency components. And that's why if you work with Adobe Illustrator or Adobe Photoshop and you want to blur an image, it tells you that you can run a low pass filter, so that returns only the low spatial frequencies, so that's where little happens as a function of space, left to right, up or down, and you get the inverse with high spatial frequencies. And guess what? Neurons in V1 have tuning curves for low, middle, and high spatial frequencies, so your brain is doing this that you can do in Photoshop, it's doing it gratis for you as you sit there. That seems very esoteric, but I will show you it has profound implications. So for example, if I ask you, who is this? And that's a high spatial frequency image of a famous person, you might struggle, but if I show you the low spatial frequencies, you will immediately recognize who this is. But if I do the inverse, and I show you a low spatial frequency image, you immediately recognize who this person is. And that is remarkable, because if I zoom in a little bit more, I never really showed you a face. All that I showed you is dark and white blotches right next to each other. But because your primary visual cortex is dissecting images, 
into low frequency components, or a low frequency image and a high frequency image, and that is what's handing off to the rest of your brain. Somehow, your brain does a very poor job at taking high spatial frequency images of faces. And it's really good at recognizing faces. Even if you've never seen this photograph, never even met this person, you're able to make out who this is just on a bunch of blobs. All right, so let's summarize. We talked about V1 anatomy. We talked about the map that we have. We call this map the retinotopy of V1. And we talked about cortical magnification, which is that even though there is a map in the primary visual cortex, it is distorted. It is vastly overrepresenting the center of your view. Again, that's called magne uh, cortical magnification. We talked about the lamina structure. That is the first thing you can see if you look at primary visual cortex and how this gives rise to the idea of cortical columns. And then indeed, we talked about the Nobel Prize that was handed out for discovering columns that are tuned to certain line orientations. That's what we call orientation tuning. That's happening in orientation tuning columns. We talked about the phenomena of ocular dominance, how one eye usually dominates over the other eye when it comes to V1 neurons. We briefly mentioned disparity selectivity as your ability to recognize differences, lateral shifts in your two eyes images and use this for 3D vision. And then I introduced you to the concept of spatial frequency and how images can be dissected this way and this gets done by V1. As I said, there's also motion direction, there's color, there's other things that V1 is doing, but these are the most prominent functions that people have detected and are usually associated with one, V1. So where does this leave us? Well, let's get back to Francis Crick, who, as you might remember, said that there's a lot that we know about the visual system. I would say that Francis is especially correct when it comes to the primary visual cortex. So there might be very few other brain areas, maybe the hippocampus in rodents, maybe the barrel cortex in rodents, but I'd be hard pressed to tell you another brain area where we know as much as we know about the primary visual cortex. If you go into a scientific database and you type down primary visual cortex, you will get hundreds of thousands of papers. It's one of the, it's from our brain, the best study brain area there is. But there was a second part to Francis' quote. And I just want to point out one of my favorite papers on the primary visual cortex, and that is his actual title. What is the other 85% of E1 doing? This was a paper that was published by two scientists who studied primary visual cortex and who pointed out that there are a lot of problems in the literature that start with the fact that people that use microelectrodes to study neural activity very often move on the electrode when a neuron becomes difficult to characterize. Of course, because neurons also have a different size as a function of layers, there's awareness that probably most of the V1 data that we have is just from certain layers with the large neurons. So it would be layer five and layer six. That has changed in recent years, but that is certainly one of the problems. We also tend to use in vision science a very small fraction of stimuli. And that is mostly these gradings that I showed you because they're so conveniently just having one spatial frequency and one amplitude. So that makes things easy to understand. But other than today on the slide, you're probably never gonna see a grading like that. And if you recall, the way that we found out what V1 is actually doing was by accident, by having a slight stuck. That was not a natural stimulus, nothing that was on the radar of scientists. So it's very problematic that we are doing this artificial selection of stimuli. And again, there's been work that has tried to undo that, but it's still true for most of the literature. There's, of course, problems with the theories, and there's other problems with the experimental paradigm overall, such as the fact that we tend to keep the eyes of people still while we're trying to study primary visual cortex. That's because we don't want to move the eye around if there's a map back there. The map stays the same as long as the eye stays still. So there is this estimate that all of this that I showed you, these hundreds of thousands of papers, probably characterize only 15% of the function of V1. And because of these limitations, we might run into the other part that Francis alluded to, that we have no idea how we see anything. With that, thanks so very much, and can have a couple of questions.